Good afternoon and welcome to MAE 113 Calculus for the Liberal Arts. This is lecture 32 and this is our final review. So I'm just going to just type in the chat. And just ask if it's okay. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Yes, so I can use PowerPoint and it's not going to have anything flying around, but um, this will give me a chance to kind of go through a lot of material that we've covered. And there's a lot of stuff that we did do. Um, this course, you know, this was our course uh, in the course calendar that we had to do. And we, we covered the basic concepts of calculus. We did functions, limits, derivatives, and integrals. And uh, we did use a little bit of software to look at it in terms of graphing and excellent. Thank you. I, I like the, to hear that uh, people can hear me good or hear me well. Um, you know, uh, courses like this are usually kind of split up into two parts where they have the differential and then the integral part. So uh, we did, a, you know, limits and continuity. So... Um, we did the definition of a derivative, derivative of polynomials, exponential and logarithmic functions. Uh, we did uh, basic differentiation, including product, the quotient and chain rules. We did second order derivatives, convexity, extreme points. Um, and that's usually with optimization. We did applications to business and economics. And then in part two, we did any derivatives, some basic um, rules of integration. And um, we looked at the definite integral. So, we covered a lot of ground. Um, for the final exam, there it, it's a three-hour closed book exam. There's nothing permitted except for a pencil, a pen, yes. Uh, just to see the a question in the chat, just confirming the exam is on the 26th of April. That is correct. Nothing is permitted except for a pen, pencil, eraser, and a ruler. Sir, could you upload uh, the PowerPoint to the classroom after? Yes, of course. Um, I'll probably, I will probably do uh, a PDF so that everyone can read it. I've, I have an ancient version of PowerPoint. Um, an ancient PowerPoint, um, like from 2007, so like, it's over 10 years old. I doubt people have that version. So I'm going to upload a PDF. Um, are there other questions about um, have you made the time yet? That is also a very good question. I am talking to the other sections and because I had emailed the other one, uh, other section instructors this morning to see if we could have it around 11 a.m. Um, yes. Well, I don't think we'll be able to push it to noon, but at least till about 11. 11 a.m. And the reason for that is we have accommodation, accommodated students, so it's a little bit longer for them for three hours. Um, and we have to fit this between 8 and 5.30 at RMC time for invigilation. Okay. Um, so, uh, Mr. Sullivan, I believe, yes, hopefully that answers your question. I will post more up at a specific time. And then... It'll be invigilated over Zoom. Uh, details of the setup are on, will be on Moodle. <laughs> I wrote it in the present tense. The other thing that you must have is ID. I'm not going to be the only person invigilating. There'll be another person to watch and they too will be watch, uh, looking for your setup. Make sure that your setup is following what Moodle says. Otherwise you may not, you risk not writing. They might not let you write. So make sure that the view is clear. Um, you might be asked to show your papers, for instance, like uh, make sure that um, if you're writing something, oops, I open the camera, you know, make sure the paper is white or, long, or free of any writing on it. So again, be ready for that. Um, the format. There's no multiple choice questions. Um, my previous years I did have, sir, I don't have a printer. This won't be a problem. Ah, I, I, I have it 
on this slide write down this one right here so don't don't worry i've i've got that covered oops so the format there's no multiple choice questions there's uh, no formula sheet for the id if we can yes a mil yes military id is fine yeah notice that i just said must have id um, there's going to be between 8 and 10 questions worth 10 to 15 marks. So what's the domain of that? The domain of that should be, well, there's 8 to 10 questions. And they're worth 10 to 15 marks. So the domain at the minimum should be 80 times 10, which is, so there's 80. And uh, there's 10 questions at the maximum times 15, so that could be 150 marks. So there's your range. So your domain on the closed interval from 80 to 150. Uh, full solutions are required for each question. Again, you have to give me enough detail. Mysterious answers will not receive marks. So if you differentiated something and you didn't show any steps it's just you just wrote it all out um and it requires a little, couple more steps like a chain rule or a quotient rule you might not receive marks and just confirming cam scanner will be accepted again um that's a good <laughs> that's a good question too um i will get to that one um, print out the exam and there will be space to write your solutions if you don't have a printer you may write your solutions on clean paper Again, clean. Make sure it's clear. Um, you know, be very careful about writing on something like notepads or something like that, where or notebooks, and you rip them out because um, the little um, edges could leave shadows or something like that. Be careful of that. Um, after the exam, you're allowed to scan your work. Ensure that the single PDF generated is clear and readable. If it is blurry, or oh yes, no, as I don't. I don't care about the watermark at the end. Uh, sorry, I'll just keep reading here. After the exam, you're allotted time to scan the work. Ensure that the, that the single PDF, so again, one file generated is clear and readable. If it's blurry or out of focus, marks cannot be awarded. So again, test your method before the exam date. I wish I could show examples, but I can't because again, privacy. Um, but if I can't read it, um, I, we can't give any marks for it. So again, and apparently we will be discriminated against if using graph people because we're all, uh, <laughs> if that's the only thing that you have like graph paper, that's okay. But, um, <laughs> Um, oh, yes, and one other thing I should make and mention of, there's no proofs of the derivative rules, okay? I'm going to be very clear about this, but you will be asked to use the definition of the derivative. So, oops, I keep writing. So, like this one over here, that's the using the definition of the derivative. So, you're given a function using the definition, you find what the derivative is. So, again, no proofs of the derivative rules. Um, we covered a lot of topics. We have, we'll probably have questions on limits. So again, from lecture six, we went over the basic properties. We had the sum rule, we had the product rule, reciprocal, constant rule, and the identity. Usually when we have questions uh, with limits, there's kind of um, three kind of ways of attacking a question. There's usually by factoring, uh, by using the common denominator, or by using the radical conjugate. And again, I just put little um, reminders here. There's from lecture six and from lecture eight. What kind of questions do we expect on the final exam is, you know, examples from the lecture. So uh, this one over here, this is finding the interval of increasing and decreasing of a polynomial here. Uh, questions from the assignments. For example, this is from our textbook that we've been using for this course. Um, and that's off of a list of problems that we had done. Let's see. This is the function in the figure. Find the limit as x goes to a for 
0, 1, 2, 3, 4, if it exists, in each case tell whether. So again, you should be able to quickly look at this. It exists at 0, it exists at 1, it doesn't exist at 2, it does exist at 3, and it doesn't exist at 4. And again, we should know what our different discontinuities are. This is um, a jump, this is an infinite discontinuity. Actually, uh, yes, uh, just a second. Sir, do you know how many word problems will there be? I'm not sure what that, in terms of, oh, and there's lots of questions in here. Sir, last time I was called by you because I was checking my phone. I do not have a printer. Am I going to have the same issue with the other staff? I'll be there too. Um, but again, minimizing touching your phone is a good thing. Um, so do you know how many word problems there will be? I don't. But again, we'll, we'll have applications and you should kind of figure out the, the proportion of it. I won't give a number. Uh, cut down some trees and make some DIY paper. Um, you won't have to. And is this final a must pass to pass the class? There is nothing in the course syllabus that says that we that you have to pass this exam to pass the course. Although, um, yeah, we don't have any we don't have a rule like that in this in the course syllabus. So, um, and questions from the test. So we did questions from lecture or sorry, examples from lecture, questions from the assignments, questions from the test. Again, here's like an example that we had from our first test. And make sure you go back and look at the corrections on there. You don't want to make the same mistake twice. Okay. Wish I could find my mouse. There we go. Um, we have the, you know, what is a derivative? We had kind of the three interpretations for it. We had the physical interpretation, which is like a rate of change. We had the graphical interpretation, which was a tangent. And then we also had the function interpretation of that, which is this one right here. It's, uh, oh, yes, it's like this one right here. Um, over here, what you can see here is I have my two points along the curve and I connect it with a, with a line. And the idea is, is that uh, this is called a secant. And as that, these two points come closer and closer to each other, it will get in the limit, it touches at one point. And when it touches the curve at one point is what we call a tangent. So the function interpretation of this is we have that, uh, we have this algebraic expression. But also, um, what this represents is the slope of the tangent. So, of course, we had done the definition of the derivative. So you'll have, you know, using what we have up here, you'll have a function. You should be able to um, apply the, the definition to that function and uh, either expand, simplify, and using your limit rules, get to the demonstrate that the finding the defin uh, the derivative. Uh, so I have an x squared here, and I you can also differentiate a square root of x. This was from lecture, both of these examples were from lecture eight. We had lots of, oh, sorry, not lots. We have derivative rules. Um, these are from lecture eight and nine. So we had the sum rule. So on the left-hand side here, we have the sum rule, which is if I have um, f plus g, if I wanted to take the derivative of that, it's the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. And on the right-hand side here, I have the Leibniz notation for it. Uh, we have the difference rule. We have the product rule, which is if I have the product of two functions, f and g, it's equal to the derivative of f times g plus f times the derivative of g. And then we also have the quotient rule. So we have, uh, you know, the up-down or a frac um, uh, not a fraction, but a rational expression so we have f and g so it's the derivative of f 
or I probably said usually derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. We also have chain rule. So if you have a function that is composed of another function that we usually took it as um, we took the derivative of the outside function and we leave the inside function alone times the derivative of the inside function. And so this was from lecture 12 and this was from lecture 13, which was that the chain rule is explaining how to meaningfully multiply rates together. And so we had that example of Hussein Bolt. And he's saying he's, um, if we wanted to look at the, how much faster Bolt was than a horse, we had D Bolt over D horse. And we saw that if Bolt was two times faster than a train and a train was three times faster as a horse, then he was six times faster than a horse. We also did the exponential and the logarithm. So that was from lecture 27 and we had lecture two. So again, you'll have to uh, remember those. Um, with the applications of the derivative, we did physical applications. So again, this was from lecture 14 that the rate of change of position, which is if we differentiate, so we drop down here, that's the velocity. So that's the rate of change in position. If we differentiate that, that's the rate of change in velocity, and that's the acceleration. And if we differentiate the acceleration or, you know, the rate of change in the acceleration, that's called the jerk. And we can actually go back up or undo the differentiation by integrating. So if we had the jerk, uh, we can integrate, which is the area under the curve, and we get the acceleration. If we integrate the acceleration, which is the, or finding the area under the acceleration curve, we get velocity. And finally, we can actually go from velocity if we integrate that to get to position. So we had lecture 14 that covered that. We had lecture 15. Here's an example of a particle moving. So we can, we have uh, a polynomial here. We can differentiate that once and that gets us the velocity. We can differentiate that again to get the acceleration and again to get jerk. Um, and we can also undo that. Again, um, the acceleration here, we're going to go from the acceleration to the in, uh, to the velocity. So integrating that um, also brings us to the issue of the constant. Again, remember, we have it plus C. We lose some information when we differentiate. So uh, we need some like initial value to help us figure out what C is. So if we said that the velocity at zero is equal to two, then we could substitute that in and find what that constant was. Um, business and economics applications. We had uh, the demand function, we had the revenue function, and uh, we also had um, the profit function. So again, the profit function is, we have the revenue, which is the total amount that is generated, minus the cost. And so it could be expressed as P minus, uh, equals Rx minus Cx. So, um, so this was from lecture 11. And any of these functions, if you take the derivative of it, will give you the marginal. So for instance, if I have the revenue function over here, the Rx, if I wanted the marginal revenue, then that is just taking the derivative. And again, the little uh, cartoon up top there, the derivative is equal to marginal. So we also have average cost. So if you had, uh, you want to look at the average cost, it's the cost function divided by the number of units, x. So that will give you c bar x. And you can also get the average, uh, the marginal average cost by taking the derivative. We also did the elasticity of demand function, and that was from lecture 22. So again, it's just minus p times the derivative 
of the demand function over the demand function. And uh, it's elastic if the elasticity, elasticity of the domain, uh, the demand is greater than one. It's inelastic if it's less than one and it's unitary if it's equal to one. Optimization, we had uh, kind of six steps. This was from lecture 20, understanding the problem. You know, what's your known, your unknowns, your givens, your conditions. Draw a diagram. Introduce some notation, dividing variables is very important. So again, we have this box. This was a, an example from lecture 20. We had a cardboard box, we were folding it up and uh, we're cutting out squares. We're asked what is the dimensions of the box which yields the max volume. So we defined our variables. So this was part of part one. Um, I've drawn the diagram right here. Then we start to introduce our notation and then we start to apply an optimization technique. So again, we need to find the function, the V in this case is the volume and we want to maximize it. We also need that constraint. And then we start to apply our maximization technique here. We're going to make sure that we have the maximal volume. Um, because this is on a closed uh, interval, we're working on the interval from zero to five here. We have our we have our endpoints that we need to check, and then in the middle we have our critical point that we need. I found optimization particularly challenging. Is there any chance we could do a difficult review question if time permits? We can try. Yes, I'll try. Um, the other thing that I could do, I should bring up, is that we could have a tutorial on this weekend. So a tutorial on Saturday. And what I can do is um, it'll be from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, I'm not sure yet, but hopefully we'll have Zoom available. So I can ask questions. You can ask questions. Um, and, you know, depending on how many people show up, you know, I can stay as long as needed. So again, this is, I just don't know if we're going to do it over Zoom or through Big Blue, but depending. Uh, and then stating conclusions. Curve sketching is a section that we did, which covers a lot of um, concepts that we did from the domain of a function, which was part of our review at the beginning of our course. Um, number two, we have the x-intercepts and y-intercepts. We have the horizontal and vertical asymptotes. So again, this involves dealing with limits with infinity. Um, number four, we have it where it's increasing and decreasing on which intervals. Number five is also local min and max. So again, those are finding um, from the number four here, we actually find critical points. And from number five, we can look at the behavior around those critical points to deduce if they are maximums or minimums. Number six, uh, we have concavity. So you can tell if a function is concave down or concave up in on the intervals. And then from there, we can also check if there is a point of inflection. And using one through seven here, all of these uh, information that we've done, we can sketch it. Again, you don't have to remember, you know, when you were, I just don't go say, sketch this curve uh, using all the concepts that you know from calculus. Um, no, they'll be broken down in parts. So there's a part A, a part B, a part C, very similar to, well, similar to what we did on test two. Um, someone else wrote, are we not using daylight savings times? I'm pretty sure that standard is in the winter. I 
think that we are I'm not sure <laughs> I think we, I'm just gonna follow whatever RMC is following so whatever the clock tower says and hopefully they have it working uh, that is what we'll use uh, we did exponential functions, so here is a continuously increasing over r. This is y equals 2x. We keep hearing about this all the time in the news, especially with COVID. And the upward trend that we're currently in. Um, again, there's domain range, the y-intercept. Again, you should know the characteristics of this function. Um, if the base, which is 2 here, in this case, is greater than 1, then we have it increasing continuously over r. And if the base is between 0 and 1, like for instance a half, then we'll have it decreasing over r. But of course, the range will still be greater than 0. We also have um, just that there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And then, of course, you can sketch functions. So, again, we had a 2x here with our kind of base function. We can also uh, sketch it by, say, shifting it up by three units. And again, that would translate all of our properties uh, as well. So, for instance, uh, the domain stays the same, the range stays the same, but the horizontal asymptote shifts up by three units and the y-intercept also shifts up by three. We also did the logarithm function. So over over here is the laws of the logarithms from lecture 27. We also know that the logarithm is the inverse function of the uh, exponential function. So over here I have my bx and that again that base is greater than one. Um, and if I reflect it in the y equals x axis, then I get this function right here, which is log b of log of base b time, uh, of x. And that's from lecture 26. Another, here's some other kind of identities that are kind of useful. Again, since they're the inverse, that if I apply the exponential function times the logarithm that I should get back my original value x. Now with these exponential functions and the logarithms, we also were able to model some situations. So from lecture 28, we derived um, a model which was over here, y equals c naught e to the kt. We had done something with like bacterial growth and so under ideal conditions, if there's enough food space, freedom from other competing organisms, um, we can actually calculate how it grows over time, how much there will be at a certain time, uh, or what thresh when it reaches a certain threshold, what time that's gonna be. So we did that example. Um, other things that we did was compounding interest. So we did it for like um, compounding, you know, annually, biannually. Um, all the way up to daily. And the other one that we did was uh, compounding continuously. And so that required the exponential function as well. Um, we also looked at the logistic curve. The logistic curve is that it uh, will increase. There will be some inflection point at this some point here. And the idea is that this makes it a little bit more uh, reasonable, that it doesn't grow without bound. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, okay, I'm just seeing the questions up there too. So yeah, we had the logistic curve and um, we kind of have a horizontal, we kind of, we do have a horizontal asymptote so that it doesn't grow past a naught. 
The question was, is any chance you could also upload an example of the test from previous years? Yes, I'm trying to track down one. I'll probably give the, the one that I gave last year, but I would be careful about looking at last year's exam. The reason for that is there is questions that we didn't cover this year. And uh, last year we had it as a two hour exam with a 30 minute or 30 minute um, multiple choice. So again, there's, it's a bit, it's, it'll, it's different from what this year is. So again, small caveat, but yes, I can try. We had um, issues during the summer, which everyone knows. I'm not going to talk about that, about our, the, uh, anyways, the integral rules. So we had uh, the power rule. So again, we can use we can handle something with x to the n, so it's just x to the n plus 1. We have 1 over n plus 1. Um, and then it says, what about n not equal to minus 1? Well, we know how to handle that now over here. That is when, if we have 1 over x dx, that's equal to ln of the absolute x plus c. So we have all these rules. We have the power rule, the constant multiple rule, which again says if I have a constant, I can pull that out in front of the integral. And then I have the sum rule, which means that I can uh, split the integral up over that addition. So if I have integral f plus g, that's equal to integral f plus integral g. Same thing applies for difference. We also, so I put again the little, uh, this is this right here is from lecture 14. This list of indefinite integrals is from lecture 30. And we have the substitution rule for the indefinite integral, which was lecture 31. We also have the substitution rule for integrals. Second. So again, I that was from lecture 31. And we have like uh, the integral of x squared over the square root of 1 minus x cubed. So again, for the substitution, we pick something that um, also, if we differentiate that, there's some sort of uh, term that we can actually replace with, with that du. So in this case, we had picked the u equals to be 1 minus x cubed. Differentiating that to get the du, I got the minus 3x squared. And um, bringing that over, I got minus 1 third du, which is equal to that. So again, I can replace that, and we get back to an integral that we can easily solve here. Again, the integral of u to the minus 1 half, that's straightforward for us using our power rule. The other thing that I should mention is that with this, with the integral rules as well, we have the definite integral as well. So if I had something like that, so we had solved this for x squared over square root of 1 minus x cubed dx, and we know that that is minus two-thirds square root, just from what we had done from that example. Now, what could happen is if I change this so that I go from zero to one, and we'll evaluate that. from 0 to 1. Then I substitute in here. So 1 minus 1 minus minus. Be very careful of your minus signs again. 1 minus 0. So 1 minus 1 gives me 0, so this cancels out. I'm left with plus 2 thirds 
and square root of 1 is just 1. Okay, so that's the end. I will switch over to my papers, my paper. So congratulations, that is the end of the course. We've done all of that material. It's a lot. And you should be very proud that you've finished the first year course in calculus. So again, we covered all what we were expected to do, the functions, the limits, the derivatives, and the integrals. Um, as for... The question somebody asked was for the 24th. I can... What I plan to do is to do the 17th. And I am just... I, I'm writing on a piece of paper. So I plan to do it on the 17th, and I could also do it on the 24th. Again, depending on how much interest is, is in for it to, like, ask, answering questions or solving problems. Oh, there's a macro exam on the 24th. Okay. Well, there... Uh, it's okay. So there's an exam on the 24th. Um... And what about on the 23rd? Or what, yeah. How is the 23rd? And there's a question, will we be able to take the final exam mark as our final grade for the course? Well, it's not written in the course syllabus, is my answer. For me, the 17th is a bit early as I... Okay. It's clear for me. Okay. So, I what I'll try to do is I'll do the two... So that will be about four hours in total. Maybe. We'll see. It could stretch longer. So I'll do it on the 17th and then the 23rd. And again, to utilize stuff like that, make sure um, bring your questions. Bring questions. Um, feel free to send me emails. Take pictures of the work that you've done so that you, if you have, if you're stuck or something like that, send me uh, what you've done and I can help you on that.
Now, as for the, somebody had asked about an optimization question. Um, would I be able to do something quickly? Well, what I could do is, what I would suggest is going through the lecture notes again. So, um, let me just pull up what we did for that. I think that was... Solution assignments. Okay, so for instance, let me pull this over to the side. Uh, we had done that optimization problem where it was, you know, bells lying a fiber optic cable, and we had two subdivisions which were located on opposite sides of the creek. There was 100 meters. We had to connect them between two points along a bank. And you had two different costs. You had the underground and the underwater. What was the cheapest way to do that? Again, if you just had this text, like no picture, that would be my first suggestion. Number one, draw a figure. So we did that and we started labeling it then. So again, just reading that information, we found that uh, it, there was a hundred meter wide creek and opposite from that, it was uh, 1200 meters from it. So what we had done is we knew that we had underground cable and underwater cable. And we needed to find the point S, which would minimize our cost. So we found, um, in this case, probably the difficult part was um, applying Pythagoras' theorem and realizing that we had a right angle triangle. From that, we know that we had 100, which was uh, along one of the legs of the triangle, and on the other side, it was going to be uh, 1,200 meters minus x. So using Pythagoras' theorem, it was going to be the hypotenuse. The length of the hypotenuse is the square root of, of, of this squared plus the width of the creek squared. And so this length of the cable here is going to be underwater. So that's where we got this one right here, which was the underwater cost, $80 times the hypotenuse. And then over here, we had the length of the cable on the underground, which was 40 times X. So we found the interval, that was our domain, and then we applied our minimization technique. Again, we had to differentiate this cost function and set it to zero, and that would give us our critical point. Let's, and then it was said to be continued because it went on into lecture. Um, lecture 21. So we continued that. So this part was the differentiation part right here, setting it to zero, again, solving for x. And we found our critical points was uh, 1,142. So that was one of our critical points. We checked the endpoints, which was zero and 1,200. We found the one that was the smallest value in this case, because we want to minimize the, the cost. And we were able to figure it out. So in this case, it turned out that the global minimum was uh, 54,928. And that was if we laid um, 1142 meters underground, and then the rest would be strung uh, along the hypotenuse or the um, underwater. The other optimization problem that we had done, 
again, this was dealing with um, finding the global maximum and the global minimum. Again, this was the extreme value theorem that we needed. Again, if we have a closed interval, then there must be a global maximum and a global minimum of that function. So we have this function here. Essentially what we want is where is it, where is the tangent flat? And if it's flat, then it's, more, it's a candidate for being a minimum or a maximum. So that's why we're interested where it's equal to zero. So when we solve for the derivative and set it equal to zero, we found that there was a critical point at x equals zero. So that makes sense here. And we also had the endpoints from minus two to two. And when we calculated those, the putting it back into the original function, um, and remember, don't put it back into the derivative because if you've found the critical points, you're going to get f. E you're going to get uh, so you you solve for it, you got x equals zero. If you put it into the derivative, of course, you're going to get back because that was the answer you got. So you need to put it back into the original function and get that value. So we found that this one was the biggest one, so that was the global max, and this was the smallest value, one fifth. And so there was, um, you know, we did it with different functions. We have a polynomial here. Um, we did an application where we we're looking for the total profit for manufacturing a product, and they sold X units. So we had the profit function. So again, you might not be given the profit function directly. You could be given the revenue and the cost separately and be asked to find the profit and then um, asked to max maximize the total profit. And how do you do that? Well, you take the derivative of that. We're looking for critical values. And then we check the endpoints. And uh, now, do we have to test the endpoints? Again, this is does. This is using the second derivative test. And then uh, here's another application again. Okay, let's not go too deep into that lecture. But all the lecture notes are available online through Moodle. So you should have all of the notes that we had. So over here, we started with the introduction, there was review, we had the functions, limits, formal definition. All 32, eventually I will upload the PowerPoint presentation, and then there's also the four tutorials that we did as well. Okay, so how is everyone feeling? Are you that we've gone over, you know, you should be proud that you made it through all this material. It's a lot. Are there any more questions before we sign off? Okay. Well, enjoy your lunch, and I wish you all the best for the exam. I will post more details. I think the feeling of relief will kick in when the exam is done but it's very nice to be all finished classes. I echo your sentiments. Yes. It is, um, it's always better when it's done and done. So, but this is all the material that we have. 
Excellent. Thank you all for, uh, it's been a very, I'm going to say, I, I, as a rule, I don't use the term interesting. It's, it's a New Year's resolution. It's been a very weird year. And I appreciate everyone for hanging in using this uh, different course delivery system than we're used to doing. Um, I know I, I really miss a chalkboard. I miss uh, being able to talk and to interact quickly. And again, um, thank you for putting up with the uh, time lag. I know it's difficult. Um, yes, I appreciate it. And I hope that uh, uh, if you do need more help, again, there's tutorials that we can have through Zoom. Um, check out the Math Help Center. They have tutoring available. They have tutors there. Uh, and talk to one another too. Like if you are stuck on something, ask a friend. You don't, I mean, I don't mind answering emails, but again, they might have a better way of explaining it to you because they have also taken other economics courses that, again, I am, I'm not sitting in those. So there's terms and or examples that your other professors may have used that makes it clear or, um, easier for you to follow. So again, use your friends and your colleagues as a resource. You can use me as a resource. There's the Math Help Center. There's the tutorial. Again, if uh, you missed a class, you can always go back to watch the YouTube video. And um, yes, thank you. I appreciate all of you and the uh, keeping it lively in the chat. Have a good lunch. I wish you the best and I'll see you at the exam.